Is it too hot for anybody in here, or is it, we okay? Okay. I was going to say, if anybody's too hot, um, I can turn it down and I'll just grab somebody else's jacket and put it on too. Just be ready, sisters. I know you're not. Uh, I know you're not cold. Thank you, Jesus. Um, sister Sue, why don't you lead us in prayer tonight? Praise God. Unto the old do I lift up my soul unto the old. Do I lift up my soul? Oh my God. I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me, yea, but none that wait on me be ashamed, yea, let none that wait. Only be ashamed, oh my God, I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Thank you. Show me thy way. Thy ways, O oh God, show me thy ways. Thy ways, O oh God, oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Unto me, O oh Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto me, O oh Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God. I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. tonight, uh, just before church, as a matter of fact, and I was listening to uh, Francis Chan, and boy, what an image that the Holy Spirit had given to him about us abiding in him. So, so you got anything to say? Yeah. Or, okay, praise God. Well, I'm going. I'm just going to give this testimony. This perfect timing, then. Um, anyway, so Francis Chan's explaining in this conference that he's preaching. He said, "I want to bring a new thought to how we think about abiding in Christ." Um, and I think all of us have heard that we need to abide in Him. The branch can't produce.
use unless it's part of the vine, so therefore we have to abide in him. And then he said, he's talking about his daughter. He said, now my daughter is about ready to give birth. She, he said, she is so much with child, it looks like she's just going to bust. And um, he said, that baby has got the exact idea of what it means to abide in. Jesus said, we are to abide in him. A baby abides in its mother. Likewise, we are to abide and be completely dependent upon Christ. A baby is totally dependent upon its mother. Likewise, we are to be totally dependent upon Christ. We are receiving all of our nourishment from Him, all of our strength. We are completely protected by Him because we are abiding in Him. What a wonderful illustration that we just need to be relaxed and abide rather than trying to do things on our own. We're we're always trying, I think in some way, and this isn't Francis Chan and what he had to say, but we're trying to prove how strong we are as Christians all the time. You know the marsupials that get in their little pouch and babies inside? Oh, that looks pretty good out there. It looks like I'm not ready to get out of the pouch. We need to stay and abide with Christ. And if we don't, well, there's, a, there's one big bad predator out there that is definitely wanting to take us down. Uh, wants to destroy us. And, and if you're right, if we get out of Christ, that's exactly what he will do. He will take us down quick, uh, just like a lion in, uh, will take down a kangaroo, any marsupial, they will be taken down because they don't even know the danger they're in until they're out on their own and then it's too late. Uh, we That's need to abide in Christ. Yeah. Oh, the ostriches berries are bad. Here comes the big old bad devil, Mama Ostrich. Sticks sticks the bottom up in the air and her head down in the dirt and leaves her eggs or her young free to be attacked. That's what the world does, and that's what we are looking to listen. You can't bury your head in the sand. Boy, the church has been doing it. Bob and I were talking about that. church has been burying her head in the sand and leaving those most vulnerable uh, to the attack of Satan. Uh, you ready to sing? Okay. Don't say 
the healing of Christ upon him. They stoned him, they threw him out of the city, and they supposed he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Look at that last stanza in verse 22, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Is everybody excited to have a, a lot of tribulation uh, to enter into the kingdom of God? Hey, here's the key. That's what's going to happen. We are going to go through tribulation. And I believe as we approach this age more so, we're going to see more tribulation. We are seeing it now. But it's only going to get worse. I was relating to... Um, Brother Bobby, I watched an interview with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, and he um, he was saying that Hamas wants to kill Jews. He said this isn't something new. Jews have always been the target. They were the target in Egypt. Um, they were the target by the Nazis. And of course, I think we understand why, because these are God's chosen people, and so Satan hates them. But he mentioned one other thing. If you think they're just coming for Jews, you are mistaken. They are going to come after Christians as well, because Christians have been supporting Israel, and all of those true Christians will continue to support Israel. We will be targeted also. We're going to go through tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. The question is, are we going to be hindered by the circumstances that Satan brings about through his attacks, through persecutions, through afflictions, through these tribulations, or are we going to stand firm? Sometimes we are hindered by Satan. God's plan still goes off, but we ourselves were hindered. In other words, uh, we got there late. I remember uh, we were in Texas. This would have been 1972, and um, we were setting up uh, the gospel tent in Beaumont, Texas, which is just north of Houston. Well, no longer just north of Houston. Is part of Houston now, uh, as Houston has grown and grown and grown. But at that time, it was a separate entity. And uh, my uncle Rick had went to Dallas, where the tent was, to pick it up and bring it back. And he was a day, a full day late, because they had had two flats at the same time, and they only had one spare. So they had to wait for a tow truck to bring a tire from Dallas to them where they were out 100 miles in the middle of nowhere. As you well know, there are lots of cities in Texas, but there is a lot of open ground. A lot of Texas. And so it, it's, well, it's a, it's a full day or more drive from one end to the other. Exactly. And so that's where they found themselves, and they waited for the truck. They, then they had trouble getting the tires on. They finally got it on, and they got there, and the, as my, my dad was already standing there, you know, patting his foot on the dirt, and my, my uncle said, Charles, we had two flats. He said, I don't care. We are a whole day late. Now we got to make it up. Are you ready to work? And said, I'm going to have to have a few hours of sleep because we haven't even slept in a day full since we left yesterday morning. And 
so they took four hours of rest and then they began to put it up and they got it up and got fully ready to go just about three or four hours before the service began the next night. Woo! Hindered. That was the hindrance of Satan. And do you think he doesn't control things like that? He does. He loves to hinder, but remember that God ought. He can't do anything with, without God's allowance. Yeah. And so he uses that allowance. God gives that purview just as he did to Job that we might be tested, that we might be tried to see if we are fit, to see if we will go ahead and go through. So we may be hindered, but God's will is not hindered. His will is not Stopped. Praise God. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we will be reading in verses 11 and 12. 3, 11 and 12, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, let's read that last verse if you in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 11 12. Verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm going to take the opposite. He says, all that live godly will suffer persecution, and it makes it sound like to me that those that live ungodly in a non-committed way, will not be persecuted because they have no reason to be persecuted by Satan. So therefore, when we see someone being persecuted, they're doing something right. They're being persecuted for a reason and for a purpose, just like the pastor up in Edmonton, Grace Church up there, thrown in a maximum security jail in uh 2020 in the height of COVID and he wouldn't shut his church down. He was persecuted. Why? Because he was living godly, doing what God would have him to do and we will be ridiculed, we will be persecuted, we will be lied about. Accusations will be thrown at us. Fortunately, praise God for that, that they will fall off. It may take a while, but they will fall off and they will be proven to be wrong because we are going to face those things because we are standing with Christ. Satan does hinder, but he cannot stop the will of God. Uh, Often I've not been able to sing, but it didn't stop me from preaching. Uh, part of my ministry is singing, but preaching is the number one thing. That's what God called me to do. And I have rarely been stopped from preaching. Regardless of how sick I was, I still preached. Because I realized one thing, I did not want to be easily. We decide how easily we will be hindered. It's not the devil who decides it. God does not decide how easily we will be hindered or slowed down or stopped. That's us. In other words, if the devil can plant a roadblock in our prayer life, he'll plant it. He'll make it as hard as he has to to get us to stop. And if he can get us at the lower bracket down here, then that means he doesn't have to up the game. He doesn't have to do any worse. He doesn't have to make it worse. He just has to come back to us with a small amount of discouragement to keep us from praying, keep us from reading, keep us from studying, keep us from going to church regardless. And, and by the way, some of us may have one of those uh, inferences defeated in one of them, or maybe two. 
but it's the other one that we have a problem with we may have it to where we just simply don't miss church but we miss intimate prayer time with God and it doesn't take much to stop that it may be that uh, we it's not the prayer but it's the Bible study or it's the Bible reading that we stumble at and if Satan can put in a hindrance in front of us he will he'll do it to see where we will go to see what we will do and what ends will we take the persecution we endure and endure will appear as a hindrance to us and the ministry but we need to remember that God's will is never delayed never stop and that what experience is persecution for the gospel's sake and it fits perfectly into his eternal plan so as we're being hindered God's getting glory if we will battle if we will fight if we don't just roll over uh, anybody ever had a dog that just roll over on their back and just put up their legs you still got one of those yeah, maybe you just tickle them a little bit and they just oh, yeah. that's it I'm done I'm not going I'm not going to resist that's the way some believers are with the devil one little hindrance and they just, oh I just roll over on their back and I'm done it's too much for me <laughs> Zechariah chapter 3 though tells us the strength that we actually have this is what God does for us if we will but wait on him and show a spirit of faithfulness. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? This one belongs to me. I have taken him out of the fire. He's mine. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre, that's the bishop's hat, upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. No matter how hard Satan fights, no matter the persecution we go through, Jesus, our Savior, will get us to the job on time. If we will be patient and persistent, regardless of what the devil does or people, we will see the will of God finished. God wants us to understand that no matter what attack Satan brings, as he here we see Joshua, and we see him at first as this high priest, in which we are we are priests, every single one of us. We're the high priests of God. Uh, we're doing his works. His works, priests, and the kingdom of kings. God has set us in. But here we also see who Joshua is. Who are we? We're that one that is clothed in filthy garments, and they have been removed, they've been taken away, and our iniquity has been caused to pass from us. And we have been given a new change of clothes. It is no wonder that Satan wants to end us. Because a priest does the work of God, and that's what each of us are called to do. 
think about this again. And I know that probably you're not thinking of yourself as priests. But that's what we do. We're part of the royal priesthood. Every believer is a part of the royal priesthood of God. And therefore, you are under attack because of that very thing. You were once clothed in filthy garments. You were once stained by sin. You have now been cleansed. You have been uh, given new garments. And Satan now considers you the enemy. Once you were one of his children. You were a son or daughter of Satan. That is what Christ tells us. Every non-believer is a child of the devil just as every believer is a child of God. And Satan hates us. And he has our number. He knows who you are. You're not hidden from him. You can't hide from him. And he's going to bring everything he has against us. But what we have to understand is, is that his job is to hinder you. Ours is to stand and take you down. Um, God will always supply a way of escape, just as he did with the Apostle Paul. Granted, you're saying, well, what about Stephen in the Bible? He was preaching to the Jews and got stoned to death. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul was the one who held the garments. That was one of the positions. Someone needed to hold the garments of those that would stone. As they stoned Stephen, he stood there and approved of what they were doing. He had murder in his heart. Some would say when he was stoned, whatsoever a man sows, therefore shall he reap. Paul stood by and watched Stephen stone, so he was stoned. Satan really took the glad tidings in that day. But we are given by the Apostle Paul from the Holy Spirit the antidote, the strength that we need in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and we will begin by reading in verse 11, and we will go through verse 18. Here is our guard. Here is the way that we can know that the hindrance of Satan cannot stop us. 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The trick of Satan. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to say this. We are not here to bash um, politicians. We are here to come against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Um, Certain politicians are in better agreement with the darkness of this world. There's no doubt about it. But they are not the rulers of the darkness of this world. They're just puppets and pawns to Satan. Because his demons are the ones that are ruling in this darkness. And against the spiritual wickedness, which is in high places, Oh, do we see the spiritual wickedness in high places all over the world. It's everywhere. It's in every political party. It's probably in every city in this nation, big or small. It's in every country. Because Satan, the world, is in control. We don't have control of the world. But God is yet undefeated. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go on further. 
in verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. So when you have stood and you feel tired and you're weary and you're ready to fall down, stand some more. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we need the girdle of truth. We need the breastplate of righteousness that protects us. Our feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means wherever we walk, we are taking peace with us. That means we should be peacemakers. Uh, that does not mean that we give in on it does not mean that we turn our eye to sin and just say, well, that's just going to go on. No, we speak up. We speak what is true. Because that is that girdle of truth. And our feet carry peace. Because it's genuine peace and not fake peace. It's not peace by attrition. It's not peace peace that's gotten by giving in on the gospel of Jesus. It's peace that is brought by his word. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You shall be able to quench. The question is, do we quench? If we've gotten hit, it's not God's fault. Because he says that with the shield of faith, we are able to quench all fiery darts. We should not be struck by fiery darts. They should be stopped by our faith. Yet, every day Christians get hit by those darts because shield is down a little bit. The breastplate is not properly strapped on. If your breastplate is hanging down, the belt is not holding it on, and you can get hit here, then you've not been properly armored. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation. Salvation is seated here because we've got to be able to have salvation controlling our will, our thoughts, our emotions. All of it has to be there. Otherwise, we will constantly be hindered by Satan. Always. And then he finishes it off, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, we're to pray always, uh, meaning, in other words, consistently. It doesn't mean that we walk around constantly praying and that we're constantly on our knees, but it means that we consistently pray. We pray by habit. It must be a habit within our lives to pray. We must see it on a regular basis, and I don't mean once a week. Or, boy, if we're praying just once a week, we're in trouble already right there. Uh, if you're praying just once a day, you're probably going to find yourself weak. Um, but we must pray always with all prayer and supplication, supplying the need, making it known to God all the time in the Holy Spirit, capital S. That's the Holy Ghost. So we are to do this in and through and by the Holy Spirit, and we watch thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
We're to pray for everyone, for every saint of God, not just here, but in every congregation worldwide. We are to be lifting up everyone. So it's not just Center Hill. It's not just uh, Walnut. It's not just Central. It's not just Baptist churches. Every single church that is teaching the Word of God in truth, we need to be lifting them up. And those that are not, we need to be praying for them that their eyes will be opened and they will be strengthened yes, to stand. If we want to see the hindrance of Satan done away with in our lives as far as actually stopping us, then we've got to go back to these verses and recognize who's in control and that all he can do is put up roadblocks, but with any roadblock, we should be able to get around it. If we fail at prayer at one point, we should be looking for the next opportunity to pray. If we uh, are discouraged in our Bible study, we need to be looking for an opportunity to make up that time and study at some other point. Trying to keep ourselves in that triunity, prayer, read, study, pray, read, study, pray, read, study, pray, read, study, and repeat it, repeat it, repeat it over and over and over again until we cannot live without it. It's got to be that we're hungry. It can't be because we're forced to do it. It can't be because it's just willpower making us do it. We've got to want it because it's nourishment. And without it, we feel weak. Um, if I go without the Word, I literally feel lost. I don't feel like I'm whole if I've missed my time reading and studying. I don't feel complete. And that's the way each believer should and needs needs to be because it says here watching, praying thereunto with all perseverance that means a strong perseverance that we're not going to give up easily, we're not going to keel over because we're tired I, I'm going to give my wife's testimony and I've been there before too we were trying to complete 24 hour prayer chain has anybody ever been involved in a 24-hour prayer chain? Whether some churches are big enough, they do the 15-minute blocks. And so you pray for 15 minutes. The church we were in was small. So we were just trying to get 24 hours. Anybody was, was willing to pray. Typically, we were trying to take up one-hour blocks. I remember taking up 3 to 4, 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. Tell you what, praying for one hour in the middle of the day is a challenge. But praying for one hour from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m., right in the middle of that sleep pattern of your brain. And you just. And I would find myself not even falling off asleep and dreaming. I would. And then I would jolt myself, how long have I been out? And didn't even know. And I'm just looking off and staring off. And I look over at the clock. Oh, thank God, it's only been three minutes. And then I would say, okay, I'm going to add three minutes. You escaping flesh. You. I'm going to add three minutes. Now we're going to go to 403. I'm not going to quit. I just... One night I ended up adding a whole hour. And I prayed from three to five because I couldn't stay awake long enough to go all the way through. So, but I was persistent. This young lady took, I think, from two to three and uh, had a hard time doing it. And then some.
someone else got sick and said they couldn't do it and was asked, is anybody willing to take an extra hour this week? And she threw up her hand and took the pledge on that. I'm not sure I understood that because I don't experience that work week cold. There you go. Whatever will keep us away. But we've got to persevere in our reading, in our study, and in our prayer. And if we will persevere, the hindrance of Satan will seem little compared to the power that God has for us. The hindrance of Satan is real, but he cannot stop the will of God. He can only stop us. The question is, will we be in the center of God's will, or will we be one of those that's been pushed off to the opposite side? I would rather die as Stephen. I would rather be stoned to death. Preaching the word. Uh, boy, he was pretty offensive uh, to those that were lazy, those that um, had crucified the Lord. He was definitely offensive because he was preaching the truth. But really, this is what I pray for. That when we're fighting a battle, that we will be offensive to ourselves. That we will find the hardest word that we can find. And we will bring it to our minds and say, here, learn by this. I'm not going to let you go. Flesh is going to submit to Christ. And if we will do that, we will overcome every hindrance. And it will only be a hindrance of the natural as with the Apostle Paul. He was not hindered spiritually. He was hindered in the natural. Common circumstances. Ships being wrecked. Being bitten by a snake. A poisonous snake that he should have died from. All of those things and more could be the hindrances of Satan. But God would have us to be victorious by simply persevering and it is done by the armor of God Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 11 let's remember that as we go throughout our day that uh, the hindrance of Satan is real but the strength of God is more powerful um, Wednesday night part 8 of our Bible basics colors of the Bible. Uh, we are going to explore, well, a lot of these colors that you see, we're going to be reading about and what they mean, what, uh, what part did they play. These colors you will find in the tabernacle and in the temple of God. And when we get to heaven, we will see these colors on display because these are God's choices, his royal colors, if you will. And um, I can't wait to see it in this bright and vibrant uh, reality when we get to heaven. But we're going to read about those colors uh, that we saw in the tabernacle and in the temple, the colors that God used throughout his word to demonstrate his will, demonstrate his authority and to demonstrate his uh, rulership, his kingship. Um, any prayer requests before we adjourn and go to our business meeting? Sister Karen Ann. Karen, uh, the first time that I ministered to her was in November of uh, 1990. And so you can tell how long that uh, we've had a relationship a ministerial relationship with her. Her name to be prayer, if you would. Um, praise God for that.
debt she has. I didn't think she would out-survive Brother Crawford, but she has. And we praise God for each one that goes on behind the word of the Lord and what he's doing and what he has done. Anybody else? Prayer request. see the need. You see some are lack of strength because of age or illnesses uh, onsetting into the bodies that are weakened by age. Lord, we understand that none of it is comfortable. And we ask you to lay your hands upon uh, Brother Jimmy, Sister Karen, bring healing to the bodies to uh, this young uh, man who fell into the pool, a respirator, all of those that we took uh, requests for this morning, those that are upon our um, prayer board at the entrance of our church, let us, Lord God, lift all of those up to you that you will bring your power to bear in their lives, we pray. God, because we know they need you. They need deliverance, Lord Jesus. God, we just submit it to you. We're, we, we're not the determiner. We're not the healer. But we're just doing what you told us to do, to bring the needs, make them known. And, Lord, we just pray today as though they were here with us. We lay hands spiritually upon them, Lord God, anointing them that you might raise them up. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to draw your attention to Friday night, uh, first Friday of the month. That is our movie night, Sound of Freedom. This was out earlier this year. Um, it is about, well, the horrible blight of human trafficking that has been going on for a long time. Um, the startling number is, is that there are more slaves in the world now than there were at the height of the slave trade in the 17 and 1800s. We thought it was bad then. It's bad now. The difference is now they don't care what color you are. They don't care if you're male or female. They don't even care if you're a child or an adult. They'll take anybody, and they will use them and abuse them and kill them. And this film pulls back the curtain on that industry. Um, we just we want you to come and enjoy this. And if you've not seen it, please do. And if you have, maybe you want to come back, bring someone with you. Because, boy, the truth needs to be seen. Okay. Um, I guess we're ready to have...